Hey guys, Equinox here, and this is going to be the Throne of Tides Mythic Plus Guide for Season 3. I'm going to go over all the trash mobs, all the boss mobs, and kind of explain to you how to deal with them and what their mechanics do. So, I'm going to pause it really quick. The first hallway that you're going to go down, there's going to be a few types of mobs. There's going to be the invaders, which are your, your basic, um, they hit the tank, they don't really do much else. They have this enrage that increases their attack speed and movement speed. Uh, you can sue this if you want, but in general, these do not hit very hard. Uh, the next mob is the Vicious Snapdragon. So these are like the scary mobs of the dungeon. Like they're really, really scary mobs. There's a couple really scary mobs, but this is one of them. Um, they do an ability called Ravenous Pursuit, which if you did under rot, is basically the same thing as the Bloodstorm or Fixate. They will leap to the target and they will start attacking them. And they have an ability or a buff called Razor Jaws. And it has a chance to inflict a bleed that stacks on every melee attack. So... Basically, you want to have the fixate happen, and then you want to CC them. Uh, these The CC does not cancel the fixate, as far as I know, and in Feign Death and Invis also doesn't cancel it. It might cancel it temporarily, but it's the same thing as the Blood Swarmer, where it doesn't get removed unless you do like a bop or something. So, uh, that's basically the one of the scariest mobs. This also happens on the tank, so when the fixate ends, they just go back to beating the tank. So stuff like Dwarf, uh, Cauterize from Evokers, Bop, anything that removes bleeds, super, super good against these. Uh, the next mob is the Nazjar Oracle. So this Oracle does a Healing Wave, a Hex, and a Water Bolt. Healing Wave and Hex. Um, Hex does not recast on CC. Healing Wave should not either, and Water Bolt does. But they have a lot of cast in this area. And then the Sentinel does an ability called Shellbreaker, which is a stacking damage taken buff on the tank, and it's a huge damage taken buff, or huge damage done. And then Crushing Depths, this is a cast on random people, and this puts a giant Absorb Shield and does ticking damage, and you have to heal the Absorb Shield off. So we're going to go to... So this pull's like, um, there's a lot of casts in this pull. There's Shellbreaker... And you see the Snapdragons are like fixating on people and I'm gripping them in. And then you basically just want to, uh, basically how you want to deal with this pull is you want to use CCs on Hex. Um, AoE CCs on Healing Wave ideally until they uh, cast Water Bolt. And then you want to use um, Kicks on Water Bolt if you possibly can. Obviously Healing Wave takes precedent and heals a crap done. So yeah. Uh, there's a lot of casters in this. You want to make sure you're locking down the casters. If there's too many casters for you to deal with, just CC one and pull in the rest. Uh, hex can always be CC'd. You don't really care about that going off. The Hex can target the tank right now. I do not know if that'll change, but as of right now, it can target the tank. So if you, And it will drop aggro on stuff. It won't like remove your aggro that you've made, but it'll make uh, other mobs hit other people. So you really want to make sure you stop those hexes on the tank. This mob that you're seeing right here is a Nashtar uh, Ravager. does two abilities. There's a Volatile Bolt, which is going to target one of the DPS or the healer and do that giant circle you see here. Uh, don't stand that. just does big, big damage. Uh, these are also accompanied by two Snapdragons, so you have to deal with these at the same time. And then you do an Acid Barrage Frontal. This is completely on the tank, and it focuses it, so if you move, it'll follow you. It just does initial damage and puts a dot on you. It's not dispellable, so to watch out for that. This mob is really easy. You can tank it with a bunch of other mobs, and all you have to do is worry about all you have to worry about is pointing it against the wall or just in an area where your team is not. Super super simple. Uh, this mob, ideally, what you do is you invis past some of the early stuff, and then just do this with the with hard pulls. Like that'll be like a big like uh, that's a good lust pull. But yeah, that's it for this. And then you you cannot, uh, as far as I know, you cannot activate this elevator until this mob dies. So this is a required mob. I don't know if they changed it recently, but the last time I went in here, that's how it worked. And yeah, you see it activates right there, and then you go up. And then this next part, so I'm going to explain something. This next part, if you have someone that's lagging behind or you're resing, if you walk into this doorway in the next part, it will start combat, uh, global combat, so people cannot take the elevator. So I'm going to show you. So you're going to get dropped off right here. If you walk through this doorway... It will start it, and once they land, global combat starts. So see here, global combat right here. I'm already in combat. Nothing's even up, but I'm in global combat because of the little guys at the end. All right, so this hallway is the same thing as the first hallway, except there's two sentinels. 
There's these deep murloc drudges, which just do a leap. They do a leaping thrash. Have you ever uh, gone against the um, swords? It's kind of the same thing, except it does like a tenth or an eleventh of the damage, it doesn't really do much damage. And then there's a Tempest Witch. So what the Tempest Witch does is an ability called Lightning Surge, which is just a debuff that pulses damage. It is magic, it is dispellable, dwarfable, stuff like that, so make sure you remove that. And then she does Lightning Bolt, which is just a kick. So CC, you can just use AOE CCs on these, um, and there's also an Oracle. So there's not much casters in this hallway, only two. You can probably get away with just CCing the... Uh, the witches or the oracles cast and then kicking the uh damage cast and that's it so the sentinels a little strat for them the guys who do the crushing depths there's these little poles around so you see the one i'm like that's right like right behind my character if i tank it on the other side of where i am people can lo spam los the crushing depths cast it does recast when you los but you uh you can los it if you don't want to take the debuff and basically locks them out <laughs> Um, you can also pre-immune it with stuff like Cloak, Spell Warding, uh, Turtle, Ice Block, if you don't go the uh, damage reduction Ice Block, stuff like that. You can pre-immune it. It is a magic debuff, so make sure you're using a magic immune. And yeah, that's pretty much the whole hallway. Uh, the next area is literally all the mobs we've gone over already. It's just the same stuff, except it's a little more compact, so I'm going to fast forward just to show you. So you see here, there's two um, there's two packs here. This is a lot of casters, by the way. If you, if you do these first two packs combined, it is a total of four casters. I don't recommend doing them together unless you have like a Vengeance Demon Hunter or a Prop Paladin or like a Boomkin with a lot of AoE CC in your group. You need some form of AoE, uh, long-term AoE silence to deal with like a giant pack with this. Obviously, if you're in like lower keys, like I'd say like... 2018 below in decent gear it's probably fine to just brute force it maybe on tyrannical it's fine to just brute force it but on fort i probably wouldn't unless you have the right AOCC. there's also a ravager that pats a room and then there's a very dangerous pack of six snapdragons and this pack is very very scary and pretty hard to deal with and it's going to require a lot of AOCC and some kiting so you see here i'm like sneaking past just to group it up a little bit easier and then you use this doorway to line of sight and basically, um, dealing with these packs is just going to be all about um, AOE CC and kicks. So this is where this is where pulling small using your CCs to separate casters is going to come in handy. Uh, there's no sentinels in this room except for the one at the very, very end. So you want to deal with as many crushing depths debuff, but again, there's a lot of casters. So I would probably what I would probably do is I would do this three pack by itself at the beginning. I'm gonna go backwards just a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. This three pack that I mind see right here, I would do this at the beginning, and then I would do the pack right behind it with the Ravager, and then I would probably do the dogs by themselves, and then or yeah, dogs by themselves, and then the three pack, and then the five pack. So yeah. I would do that in a, in a normal group. That's what I would do because it's a lot easier to deal with. Doing multiple groups at the same time is pretty hard. If you have a group you can trust, I would do the Snapdragons with one of the three packs. But yeah, I'm going to fast forward through this pack. Like I said, it's just the same stuff. You know how to deal with and the Ravagers by itself. And you see the Snapdragon pack walking around. And so this is the this is a pack I would do if you're like in a group you can trust. You can do this together. Uh, this is a triple caster pack. So again, Lots of kicks. Like, that's pretty much the theme of the dungeons. There's just a crap ton of kicks you have to deal with. And you can see these mobs are going to fixate. We're keeping them AOE CC'd. And you see the, they, like, jump to the target they're fixating, and now they're chasing them down. There's the Tempest Witch debuff. It gets dispelled. And it's just a really, really scary pack. For tanks, this is probably the scariest pack. For Brew, it's not too bad like i didn't have too much issue on brew uh vdh still felt fine any anyone who can go dwarf felt fine but yeah there's not there's pretty much just lots and lots of kicks and then i'm going to do these next two packs together as vdh i would do them separately so i would clear this entire room just for the space on the on the boss and you'll see why once we get to the boss but space is really really important and then i'll explain how those boss mechanics work 
But yeah, here's the Sentinel, and then there's two Snapdragons, and then all the casters. So again, really not ideal to do these together unless you have a lot of AUCC. So you have two, you have three Oracles and two Tempest Switch. Not only is this a lot of uh, cast, it's also two debuffs, two magic debuffs, and a crushing depths debuff, which is a lot of group damage and a lot of stuff for the healers to deal with. Uh, if you can, I've, ideally, you deal with immunes on this. Uh, you do immunes on the crushing depths. But yeah, that's pretty much the whole trash pack, and that's it for these trash mobs. That won't you won't see any of these throughout the rest of the dungeon. And then we're gonna move on to the boss. So this boss is Lady Nashtar. She has two intermission phases, one at 60, one at 30. Uh, she does cancel abilities once she gets to those health ability thresholds. So say she's casting one of her abilities, like Focus Tempest, she uh, will cancel that. And uh, go into the intermission. So she has a couple abilities. She has Focus Tempest, and she has Shock Blast. She has Geyser. So let's go over the first. Oh, and she has Water Bolt. Water Bolt's just a two-person kick rotation. And yeah, it's not too bad to deal with three if she gets weird. I would ideally kick these as late as possible. So Focus Tempest here. This So basically what Focus Tempest does, it's an initial damage and a chain lightning effect. And what the so it does not pick the same person twice for initial. It but the chain lightning can go to anybody. So the initial damage will pick one person each time up to three targets. Uh, I won't do four, but I'll do three targets and do the more initial damage. The initial damage is a lot more than the bounce. Uh, and so basically, if you got picked, you just have to make sure you're above like half HP afterwards. If you got hit by the initial, because it won't pick you again. Um, in the ch in the chain lightning it goes to the closest person that got picked. So basically, what you can do is make like a triangle around the boss and make sure the tank is the closest person to each person getting shocked, but the other people aren't close enough to the tank to where they get shocked. So basically, you can have the chain lightning only hit the tank if that makes sense. Like the initial damage will hit a DPS or a healer, and then the chain lightning, the chain part of it, will only hit the tank. Uh, I don't have a diagram of that because it's kind of it was kind of hard to set up, but yeah, that's basically the strat we figured out. It'll only chain to the closest person, so you can reduce the damage taken by there. The next ability is Shock Blast right there. If you guys did Thundering on the beta, it works exactly like it did in its first iteration. It'll put like a bunch of balls around you and basically shoot them out, and they stun you if you get hit. And then the ability right after this is Geyser. This is a scary overlap because the Shock Blast... Ability looks exactly like the geyser, so I'm going to show you here how uh, the person gets targeted. So the person who gets targeted has to really watch their feet. So you see um, see this color right here? It, it, this will happen during geyser, and then she'll do geyser right after. You have to watch your feet as the person with the geyser. It's pretty, it's pretty awkward. Then you does these, and she does focus tempest again. See one person gets picked here, and then it phases. See, you see there, she canceled. All right, so this phase, she summons... Three different types of adds. The Deep Sea Murlocs, which do the leap that you saw before in the gauntlet. The Frost Witches, which only target the tank. And then the Honor Guard, which charges and then does a Trident Flurry, which is a frontal you have to watch out for. Everything but the Honor Guard is CCable. And then she's just ch chain casting Geyser during this. And yeah, that's the uh, basically what you want to do is be on the same, everyone be on the same side so the tank can get aggro easily. Then you want to kick both frost witches in and then just chain kick them whenever you can, move them on top of the honor guard, and then once all the adds are dead, she phases. And that's pretty much the entire fight. She doesn't do anything else. Uh, she doesn't do anything special. Just these mechanics. She should focus tempest immediately out of this phase, like right here. You see it hit the mage there, and then it hit the priest for the initial damage, and then it hit the evoker. So you can see, you can see, like, it does not pick the same person twice. And that's the, that's the whole fight. We're going to fast forward to 30%. See, Shock Blast uh, did not cancel because we didn't push it fast enough, but yeah, if, it would, if we were fast enough, it would have canceled. You see, getting aggro on this is really hard as a tank if people are spread out. Like, if people are, like, across from you, it's, like, almost impossible to get aggro. It's so awkward. Um, so, yeah, like, ideally put, like, a marker down. Be, like, in this general area. Be here. Helps a lot. And, yeah, that's the whole fight. Let's uh, move on to the next fight. 
All right, so this next fight um, is Commander Commander Wolthok. So he has three abilities, at least three major abilities. He has Bubbling Fisher, which summons these three circles around um, any of the DPS or healers. And then he does Festering Shockwave, which is a big shockwave. It's a knock, and it puts a dot on you. And then there's Crushing Claw, which is the tank debuff. Um, the tank debuff is a big hit, and it increases your physical damage taken by 100% for 10 seconds. So basically, you get hit by this, you uh, defensive rotate for 10 seconds, and then you're good. Uh, and then he does Awaken Ooze, which spawns the... Uh, so basically, the bubbling fissures you drop will spawn these oozes, and you have to knock them back with initial abilities. They are not CCable, so you have to use abilities to knock them back. Stuff like Sunfire is beautiful for these. Sunfire will knock each all of them back. Uh, spinning Cray Kick also knocks some of them back, so if you're a monk player, you can just stand on the edge, and yeah. So basically, what you want to do, how this boss works, is you have everybody stacked on one marker, or in the like a general vicinity around. There's the Tank Buster. He's going to do Bubbling Fissure here. You're going to drop all the debuffs here. It's going to drop all the circles here. Boom, you see all the circles. And then you can LOS Festering Shockwave. You see I'm like moving him in this corner. That's why I'm taking it next to this pillar. He's going to do Festering Shockwave. You're going to line aside on this pillar. Boom, nobody takes any damage, no debuff. It removes all of the damage the healer has to deal with on this fight. And then you just spam knock these back. Um, Priest Holy Nova works really, really well. Sunfire works really, really well. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty easy. And then you see he's going to do Bubbling Fissure again. You drop them next to the old ones. You always want to keep them in, a, in the general vicinity of the old ones. And then you're going to LOS Festering Shockwave again. And you basically just do this the entire fight. There's the Festering Shockwave. We LOS. No damage taken. And so the next setup is going to be Awaken into Bubbling Fissure. This is where it gets kind of awkward because now you're kind of like in a little desynced area. So I'm going to show you he awakens the oozes, and then it's going to be fissure into shockwave. So you got to make sure you're prepared for this. You got to be knocking back and then do a quick LOS. Then you LOS. And that's it. And that was like the hard, the hard uh, overlap. And then the next one is fissure shockwave and then adds. So you'll uh, be able to group up the adds a lot easier. And yeah, that's the whole fight. You literally just do that, rinse and repeat the entire fight, and it's pretty simple. As long as you do the LOS spots correctly, you're good to go. Uh, now, if you ever did the other side, this is the, the other side gauntlet. It's a little bit faster than the DOS gauntlet, so you have to be careful. If you get hit, it stuns you and does big damage. And yeah, it's pretty much, that's all it is. It's really simple. Uh, it is slightly faster to jump off your DH here. It's slight, it's faster than taking this RP, but if you don't have like a glide or if you're not an evoker or something, it's not really worth it. And yeah, that's pretty much the whole gauntlet. So this next area, you can go left or right. Um, left is the way to uh, Aranax Stone Speaker, which is the uh, blob like the little uh, mind bender dude. And then right is to the last boss, which is Ozumat. So if you did this Throne of Tides back in Cataclysm, then you know what I'm talking about. So this side over here, the way to Ozumat is the way we're going to go. So he has Hunters, Aquama Hunters and Aquamages in this first pack. The Hunters jump back and do Poison Spear, which is a tank only hit or whoever they have aggro on. And then throw Spear as a nuke. It hits super, super, super hard. Um, this is going to be kind of a hard pack to deal with. Uh, I, you might, if you're like risky, you can invis past these because you don't need the percent. So you see I'm going past these just to grab something and bring it back. I'm getting a huge pull here, so this is kind of sketchy. And then we're LOSing. And then I even get the Faceless Watcher. So what the Faceless Watcher does is he does a grip in. It's called Clenching Tentacles. He pulls all the players in. And then he does uh, Shadow Smash, which is a giant circle you have to walk out of. It will one-shot you. It does like a mil-plus damage. It's absolutely insane. It is a tank buster called Crush. This is parryable, so make sure you have like any dodge parry stuff up for that. Um, and then oh, you're also going to see the Tainted Sentry. The Tainted Sentry code does some ability called Swell. And you can purge this off. It has a hidden buff on it. Uh, if you purge it with Trank Shot, uh, 
purge magic to spell anything like that or cancel to cast. I don't think we do this and we do that in this video because this is before we knew. But yeah, you can just do that. It's a little tip for you. And yeah, this pack is literally just about CC and the Aqua Mages. So the Aqua Mages have uh, a ability called Aqua Blast, and all you have to do is CC that. They don't recast on CC, so you can just like chain AOE CCs. It's pretty easy to deal with. Um, you only have to do a couple CCs. So you see, like different ones are casting now. And you just rotate CCs. And yeah, that's pretty much it. If you have, if we had the dispel, then it would be a lot easier to deal with. But we don't, because uh, we didn't know about it back then. Um, you, I wouldn't ideally do as big of pulls as I am because it's kind of scary. I would just do one Giblin pack at a time, and then do the swell, uh, swell guys on their own. You can do the swell guys with a Giblin pack pack if you do the dispels because it like pretty much removes all the damage. Uh, so when these sentries die, they spawn a bunch of little lads. They're called Unstable Corruption. And they don't do anything except when they die, they increase your shadow damage taken and do a big AoE. This has a 60-yard range, so make sure you watch out for it. Uh, basically, how you want to deal with this is don't kill them until Swell goes off, and then you kill them. Or you kill them right as Swell is going off. And then we're going to go keep going down. So I always see these unstable corruptions that I forgot about. You basically hit these, and then you just move on to the next pack. We're going to kill them just so we don't get the debuffs mid-swell, guys. Because, again, we didn't know about the dispel right, so we just didn't know. And then, yeah, we just go on to the next swell guy. And you're going to see a Giblin pack over here. So this next Giblin pack is all Aqua Mages. Six Aqua Mages. It requires an absurd amount of CC. Uh, really hope this package changed because I don't it's going to be so hard for pugs to deal with it it requires so much AWCC if you're not a VDH it's kind of rough prop alley is not too bad here you see I'm bringing it all the way back we didn't need to do this um, but we were worried about the swell I guess I don't know but yeah you see all these casters and we're going to have a really bad overlap with Swell because we're going to have this Disease debuff on top of uh, the next Swell. Unless you have removal such as Disease Dispel, Dwarf, Cauterize, stuff like that. Also, I said earlier they don't recast on CC. That I, uh, I was thinking about a different ability. The Aqua Blast do recast on CC, so you just need to be chain AOE CCing or kicking all of these. So I was pulling this just to do with the uh, little guys, so we're not just doing the little guys on their own. Probably not the best pull, since these do pulsing shadow damage. So these little guys I pulled are called the Faceless Seer and the uh, Minion of Gorsha. And the Faceless Seer does an I-beam ability. You see on the top left of my screen, it just does a beam, and it, if you get hit, it does a big chunk of damage. It silences you. And then he also does a Mind Flay cast, which is CC-able or kickable, whichever one you want. It does not recast on CC. And the minion of Gersha does a psionic pulse ability. It's a it's a cast that it has only CCable. It just does a big AOE damage. This also does not recast on CC, so you can just chain CC these, and they're pretty easy to deal with. Fear. See, they don't recast on CC. And yeah, that's it. That's pretty much how you deal with that pack. Again, more just rotating CCs, rotating kicks. It's pretty much all you do. And then we go over here. And this is going to be a triple seer and then double watcher pack. So this is kind of an awkward pull since there's so many kicks and uh, grips you have to deal with. And you basically want to just be kicking uh, all the seers, CCing all the seers. And for the tank, you need to make sure you're rotating defenses for each crush. I silence there. And then you also want to make sure you're using some AoE CC on the minions because, again, they do AoE shadow damage. Someone got killed there by the Mind Flays. So my biggest trick 
for the mind plays is pre if you're playing a VDH or you're playing anybody is pre try to CC them so they're synced. Like keep them CC'd long enough to where all the casts are synced. That way, all the casts in the future can just be instantly CC'd. All three of them at once. You can do any AOE CC and knockback or anything, and it'll stop the cast. <laughs> them being synced makes it a lot easier because then you don't have to do three separate kicks or three separate CCs. You can just do one CC per three casts, and it makes it super easy. So say like your VDH, if you pre-silence them, they're all synced like this. This makes it slightly easier because you can just again snap CC them. Obviously, like, we're not doing a great job. Like, I should have stunned while I was walking out there, and it would have made it so much easier. But yeah, they're going to all cast again. I'm going to stun them right there. Boom. Easy to deal with. So if you have them synced up like this, you can do that on purpose, and it's, it just makes it way easier. And then the next hallway is just more minions, so nothing special. That's in the uh, third boss's room. All right, so this next boss... Super simple, pretty much no mechanics. He has Flame Shock, Earth Fury, and Storm Flurry Totem in his P1. Once he's at 25%, he the Mind Bender jumps off of him and he does Mind Rot, which is just an AoE damage that he does constantly, and then Terrifying Vision, which is just a LOS. And it's a fear, does big nuke damage if you get hit, and it fears you. So this guy does a crap load of tank damage. The big defensive areas are during Storm Flurry Totem. Storm Flurry Totem increases attack speed and makes him do magic damage autos, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and it makes him do more magic damage. And you see here, <laughs> so this one's kind of funny. The Storm Totem got stuck in the wall, so you're going to see me cheat here because I'm like trying to hit it. So make sure you're tanking them away from these pillars because it can't get stuck in the wall. So what Flame Shock does is just a random nuke damage. It comes out about every six seconds, I want to say, about every six seconds. Does huge, huge damage, and then you have to dispel the dot. So it's kind of awkward if you guys did pre-nerf uh, Last Boss Temple of Jade Serpent. It would be the same thing where you just run out of dispels eventually and you can't keep up. Uh, there's the Earth Fury. And you're gonna see the shock or the flame shock come out. Watch people's HP. See what goes on Jack there, and just just collapses HP. Again, this is non tyrannical, so it's absolutely insane. Goes on uh, the evoker there, and we just don't have dispel. You can see the dispel cooldown in the top what in the top corner. It's like nowhere close. Also, a little thing: if you don't kill the storm flurry totem, he doesn't spawn another one. Like he just won't spawn it until it's dead. But he will ca cast it immediately after that one dies. There's Earth Fury again. You basically just dodge that. Uh, if you want, people can stack up, but as long as you're just not like interfering with others, it's pretty easy to deal with. And yeah, that's pretty much the whole fight. When he gets to 25%, you'll see. Okay, and then he jumps off. And then he'll do the fear immediately, so you're going to LOS. And I get stunned here because I mess up my jump and I couldn't find a good spot to jump. And he does these little, you see the AOE damage he's doing, he just like picks some people and just shoots at them. And that's it. That's the whole fight. Super simple. So basically what you want to do is rotate defensives on the um, Storm Flurry Totem as a tank. As a DPS, if you get picked with Flame Shock, if you don't, if your healer, make sure you have a dispel tracker for your healer, use Omni CD. If you, <clears throat> the healer doesn't have dispel, you want to use Dwarf, you want to find a way to dispel yourself, mass dispel, anything to help out. You also want to basically defensive once you're hit, just in case you get picked twice. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, and then we'll go to the Ozomat side. And you see more swells here. I would lust this double swell pack unless you and if they don't fix the dispel thing. So if they do fix the dispel thing, uh, I wouldn't lust this. Or yeah, if they do fix the dispel thing, I would lust this because it's going to be extremely hard to deal with. This is an unskippable pack because it starts the it unlocks the room. And yeah, but if they fix the if they don't fix the dispel thing, then this pack's just easy. All right, so Ozumat. So this is kind of an interesting fight. So basically how this fight works is he's going to do an ability called Blotting Barrage. It's going to target three people and it's going to leave a um, 
blotting darkness puddle on the ground, and it's going to expand. And then, so what you want to do is basically make an Olympic symbol with this. You want to have them, or like a Venn diagram, I guess is a better way to explain it. And there's like overlapped. And so you want to do that so it's like all combined, and then you'll get an ability from Neptalon, and it's like a big beam that lets you cleanse these puddles. And then I'll, and then I'll kind of explain further as we go. <laughs> he shoots our healer here. So this so this boss kind of weird. When you first pull him, you need to be the first one that you had to like basically be the taunt, pull him with taunt because he'll do a foul bolt instantly. If you tank the raging tempest in no kud, it does the same thing. He'll cast immediately when you pull him, unless you're like in melee range when he spawns. Yeah. And see, so see, so see this blotting barrage. We basically make like a. This is a. Ter we made a terrible diagram, but yeah, you basically want to make them next to each other. And he does a frontal on the tank. It does follow you, so you can't like jump out of it. And you use defense of that. And you're gonna see the three beams we get, or two beams, and you're going to just sweep up together. If you um, have two people in the same spot, it does clear it faster. So make sure you remember that. And here he spawns the ads. So basically, what we don't want to do is kick the two far ads. The um. Spl there's splotch and sludge splotch does the cast and then sludge just doesn't really do anything it just does a little bit of aoe damage uh when it dies and you want to basically kick the kick the splotches and then group them up and then what the how this fight works is every time these ads are like about to die basically he does another blotting barrage and you just want to put these behind where the ads die so you'll basically see that when it uh when they're about to die. So there's the blotting barrage. You put these behind where the ads die. And then you sweep it up. He's going to do the frontal here. And then everybody's going to get the beams. And then you sweep up all the stuff. The reason you want to keep it uh, organized like that is because if you don't, if you keep it more spread out, then you can't clean everything. It's not possible. If you do it this way, then the blob puddles overlap and you're cleaning multiple puddles at the same time. And then he's going to do the add spawn again. And you're going to kick the two far ones and then group them all up. And then he's going to do blotting barrage again and you put it behind where the ads are going to die. Right there. And then you're going to get two beams. He's going to do the frontal. And then you clean again. Super, super simple. That's really that's literally all you have to do. That's the full rinse and repeat. Then you kick the far ones again. And you see we didn't do a good job cleaning, so now we're gonna be like a little sketchy on space. And then you see the blotting barrage. And now uh we're gonna get another frontal soon. And then we're going to clean. See, these ads died like super desynced. It's it's kind of a mess. And then we're going to get more ads. And you get, this is kind of a good showcase of what happens when things do get out of hand uh, when you mess up the cadence. And yeah, that's uh, pretty much that's pretty much it. You just do this till the fight dies. I don't remember if we wipe here. We might. Yeah, we do. So we wipe here so we'll get to do it again. You'll get to see a much cleaner version. I get aggro there and get shot. And then these first ads happen. So I'm going to go basically fast forward to the ad part because that's like the important part where you can see it's clean. So we get these killed. We killed them next to the boss. We're going to get blotting barrage right here. Watch out for the ad explosions. Boom, they drop. He's going to do a frontal and then the beams. Yep, and then we clean. More ads spawn, and I silence the farthest one, and then we have a range kick it. And then it's going to do blotting barrage again. And then we're going to clean.
And I think the best way to clean, so me personally, what I think you do is you basically just stack the beams and just clean together. The, way, the reason you do that is because it cleans them much faster. So you're basically clearing everything in like half the time instead of spreading out and you're clearing it slower. So I think that's the way you want to do it is kind of just move as a, as a duo. Um, so l I'm going to talk about lust really quick. So I think lust, the best lust is on the first pull. So first pull, second boss, and then whichever boss you do last, you either do it on Aranac or you do it on Ozima. And I think those are the best lusts. You can get four lusts, I think. Yeah, so four lusts. So if you can, you can get four lusts and use it on like a trash back and then whatever the last boss is. That's assuming the key is like a sub four left. You see, we did a much better job. Look how clean the room is. Like, there's literally nothing in it. So these blotting barrages, we dropped a little too far back. I think uh, it would make cleaning awkward, but it's about to phase. So he's about to phase here, and you're going to get a massive damage buff, and you basically just kill the boss. That's it. Uh, you get to do big numbers here. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I uh, hope you guys learned something. Hope it helped you. Hope you enjoyed the guide. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Uh, I have a few more dungeons to go. And yeah, hope you guys have a wonderful day. Peace out. Love you guys. See you on the next one.